Kroger is a botanist and medical biochemist who calls herself a renegade scientist. An Irish woman who now lives in Canada, she's also a world expert on how trees chemically affect our environment. In her new book, The Global Forest, 40 Ways Trees Can Save Us, Diana's concocted a heady cocktail of science, elements of ancient myth and alternative medicine. When I spoke to her, she told me why trees are absolutely vital to our existence. Every breath of oxygen you take comes from a tree and partially comes from the great oceans of the planet. And if you cut down the forests, if you cut down the trees of the planet, and that is happening right now, we will not be able to breathe. It is that simple. So to anybody who, in your view, dares to question the relationship between humans and trees, you would say you wouldn't be here without them. It is the science of the world. It is the extraordinary science of creativity that I'm really talking about. It is the reaction of photosynthesis that happens in all green things, on all green matters on this planet. If we did not have the green, we would not be alive. But in addition to that, you believe that some tree groups can have an effect on human health. Just just give me some examples. Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, many of the willows, for instance, produce salicylic acids and acetyl salicylic acids, many daughter types of compounds that are produced by that tree into the waterways and into the air, into the breathing systems. And they're very, very important for our life. They're very important for as antiviral compounds. For instance, another one are the pine trees that Queen Victoria was so terribly interested in. Um, the pine trees produce alpha and beta, beta pinene compounds. And those uh, pinene compounds are antibiotic compounds, antifungal compounds. And they actually assist in our ability to function as humans. What sort of research is there then to, to back up your claims about these uh, trees' abilities? Um, these are not claims. This is scientific research. The problem is, you see, is that the chemistry of, of biological systems is very much divorced from the ecology of systems. It is very much divorced from the human functioning. And to put them all together is a form of synthesis. Um, the same type of synthesis that Einstein used is as in his equation E equals MC squared. It is putting the E, the energy, the M and the C squared together. And when you put them together, then you realize that um, the functioning of nature is very, very important for us because we are part of nature. You also, interestingly, talk about growing trees like um, the black walnut, I think is the example yes. that you make in the book as a sort of financial planning for the future. Can you explain that? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, I was told about a month ago that the financial planning of trees has just gone on to the investment market. So that's actually very good news. What does it mean, though? <laughs> it means that you can take one black walnut and grow one, just one black walnut into, into let's say, for about 60 years in, in England. Um, and you have a tree that is good enough that will sell at auction for $60,000. And it is because there is not enough black wood. The walnut produces a very dark chocolate type of wood. There is not enough of that wood in the whole of the world market today. Right. So, I mean, there's something rather ethereal and mystical, as I'm sure you'd acknowledge about much of your book. But that's a really hard headed financial decision to make, isn't it? To Absolutely. Grow a tree. <laughs> Absolutely. And indeed, in Canada and in the United States right now, people are putting in acres and acres of these black walnuts as a mixed forest back into into what it should have been in a native method for increasing the cash value of a farm or a piece of land. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. I, I said that some of the book was, was mystical. There's quite a lot of magic in the global forest. And at one point you, you ponder on the extraordinary powers of the, the quite humble elderberry. Now, what, what is so very important about the elderberry and what it can do, you believe? Well, the elderberry is a very, very ancient species. I mean, in some parts of Sweden, they still doff their hat at an elderberry and they actually bow to the magic of an elderberry. The elderberry, by way of thinking in terms of long terms of history, was used by the Egyptian queens, the the and the pharaohs for their beauty enhancement 
and it is used today in most of the cosmetics that are natural cosmetics that are used over the counter. They do remarkable things for the underlying arterioles of the female, male and female skin, and they actually refresh the arterioles and you get a less aged, aged skin. Well, uh, what do we do? Do we pulp it and literally mash it onto our face? You make what? a tisane of the flowers and the tisane of the flowers is actually rubbed on the face and it is used, you know, you see, you used to see the in these funnies cucumbers being put over the eyes of women for, for reducing... Well, some of us still do that. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Um, it, it's the same thing. What about your involvement in the movement to archive ancient trees in, in what I think you call living libraries? Tell us about that. Well, I am the person who has started, has set up um, a bank, the, the first um, master um, list of all of the most important trees of the planet. And um, I am in the process, 10% of them being, have been done, and it's setting up living libraries across the planet. Now, what we have, we already have seed banks. We have never managed to store and protect the DNA, the old DNA of the trees. This is an enormous environmental thing to do. And to set these back out into the world as epigenetic trees, into forests, into natural forests, into natural areas, to improve, first of all, the financial holdings of the land that the trees are going back in, secondarily, to reduce climate change, and thirdly, to improve, improve the quality of life and reduce the carcinogenic effects of the atmosphere we're living in right now. What about your own garden at home? Can oh, you describe it? Uh -huh. I've got wonderful trees. I've got the sacred trees of the First Nations, which are members of the Rutaceae, the members of the Orange family, the last members of the Orange family left in North America. I have cucumber trees. I have trees that produce fruits on them like cucumbers. I have all of the carrier trees, and those are the hickories. Is there a time of year when your garden is at a peak, would you say, or is it always, there's always something to wonder at? Well, there? I live in Canada, of course, you know, and the snow is just going away and the daffodils are coming up and I have the largest collection of butterfly daffodils in the world. These are wonderful, thousands and thousands of daffodils. So it's starting to come up then and I have a huge borders of hellebores, all kinds of those. And so it's starting to peak now. Um, I have a wonderful, wonderful fragrance border and I have a nuttery. I have a marvellous North American medicine walk and I have a vegetable garden which is enormous and I have all kinds of potato collections in there. So Guess many, what? So many of our <laughs> listeners will be grinding their teeth in, in jealousy and frustration. It sounds an absolute paradise you've got there. Yes, and I've just found for Europe uh, a lost species, which is a white cherry. Um, I've, I have a wish list that I give out whenever I'm doing talks. Um, and I, uh, this wish list has been going out for about 15 years, and it's a white cherry. It is a Prunoceraceus alba. And I found it in uh, in Austria, only two trees left um, and they are up in the garden right now and I have 11 of those trees. So uh, are you looking for anything at the moment? Maybe somebody listening could help. I'm looking for Caria tomentosa. Um, I have Caria not one, I'm afraid. Tomentosa? No, 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 no. This is an extraordinary tree and it was used by all of the Aboriginal uh, people for smoking, actually for smoking um, vegetables. And think about it, in the, in the past, people didn't have free refrigerators and they had to smoke and dry all of their vegetables. And they used this species as a, a form of cold smoke to store their vegetables for, for the year, really. And you would like one? I mean, yes, not like, I would like more than one. Not likely to be knocking around in the UK, is it? Or, or might it be? Um, it, no, it isn't knocking around here. It was actually before the last, um, before the last glaciation period. Um, it was found in Poland, as a matter of fact. Well, if you can help, I'm sure she would love to hear from you. That was Diana Beresford-Kroger. And now...